I've spent over five months now using the Surface Duo 2. Unlike most reviewers of this device who instantly dismissed it because it wasn't an iPhone, I've given this new innovative concept my time and energy, properly putting it through its paces. You see, whenever something new comes along that's completely out of the ordinary, most people will instantly reject it. And that's to be expected. E.M. Rogers explained this in 1962 as the law of diffusion of innovation. That law posits that a small portion of people are prepared to take the risk of frustration, failure, time and money to try out new ideas. They are called innovators. If their ideas are good enough, over time the innovators will influence the early adopters and eventually the early majority follows. You've seen this before, right? Did you own an iPhone 1? Do you know anybody that did? I knew one guy, a massive Apple fan to this day, and he had an iPhone 1. Now he's a very smart guy, but I thought he was crazy. Same could be said for the iPhone 2. A capacitive touchscreen with no stylus on a full screen phone with one button? Now that was crazy in 2007. Remember that the iPhone 1 didn't even have an app store. The iPhone 1 and 2 were phones that only appealed to the 2.5% of people who could be described as innovators in that genre. The early adopters started to buy in on the iPhone 3 and 3G. The early majority bought the iPhone 4. And the late majority in the laggards, well, they're just getting an iPhone now. I think we've all heard of this concept of early adopters in the technology world before. And the reason that I mention it is that the Surface Duo 2, even as a second generation device, is not ready for the masses. It may never be. At the moment, it's an innovator's dream, and it might capture the attention of some of the early adopters in its specific niche. For all of the negativity around the launch of this device, I did notice some interesting exceptions. For example, here in my hometown of Melbourne, the Herald Sun favorably compared the Duo 2 to Penny's computer book from Inspector Gadget. And XDA developers reviewer Ben Sin said this, I'm fully on board with the concept of a two screen portable computer that fits into your pocket because it significantly improves my productivity the way that even true foldables like the Samsung Fold series does not. I think if you added up the reviews of the Duo 2 that even opened the door a crack to a positive perspective, well, they'd probably add up to around 2.5%, once again, reinforcing Ian e. Rogers' law of diffusion of innovation. And it's not that the other 97.5% of reviewers, and people for that matter, are wrong. It's just that the idea of this device is not yet entered into their consciousness, or it's not the right device for them. All innovations must go through these groups in sequence before they hit the mainstream. Innovators first, early adopters, then early majority. So the Surface Duo 2 is not ready for the prime time, but I don't think it'll be too long. And I'll explain why as we go. But before we get into it, I wanna start off with what I believe is the purpose of this device. It is Microsoft's stated mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So what is required to be able to help people to achieve more with their smartphone? whatever this thing is. Let me share what I found. Like some people, I make calls with my phone. Lots of calls. Fortunately, most of my calls these days are on Teams and not on the phone network. VoIP solutions like Teams run at a much better and more consistent quality than the old school phone networks do. That said, the Duo 2 does support 5G and even Wi-Fi calling. But call quality is still limited by a number of factors. All cell phone calls to landlines are poor quality with highly compressed audio. Mobile to mobile or cell to cell calls can be good, especially with Wi-Fi calling, but the interconnection between carriers is usually low quality, like a landline call. So regular phone calling is hit and miss, and that's no fault of the phone. I use the Telstra network here in Australia, and when I'm making calls to other Telstra customers, the call quality is great. I mainly use the speakerphone for calls, but when I do hold the phone up to my ear, I find it a little bit hard to know exactly how to hold it and where to put the phone because its size and shape is quite weird compared to regular candy bar phones. I'm not a huge fan of Bluetooth headphones, but I have used the Surface earbuds and the Surface headphones too, and they do just fine on calls with the Duo 2. My car is a Ford Ranger Raptor with Ford Sync 3 Entertainment System, a widely used system across the world, and the Bluetooth calling experience has not been ideal. Over the last few months, I've had periods where the Bluetooth connection is very delayed when I'm accepting or initiating a call. It's usually the second call that I make, 
and it only happens when I'm plugged into the car and using Android Auto at the same time. Sometimes I've even had to switch to the speaker and back to Bluetooth in order to get the audio to switch through the car. Now I never had these kinds of issues with my Samsung Galaxy Notes. Now, this is just one of the many ways that innovators suffer for their art. Most people would have thrown it out the window after one or two events like this, but not me. I can be patient when I want to be, and I'm prepared to put up with these kinds of rough edges in order to achieve other gains. Fortunately, Android Auto works very well with the Sync 3 system. Voice commands, maps, Spotify, it all works as expected. Most of my business calls these days happen on Teams. I spend a lot of time on internal calls and in meetings with clients. Teams is one of the apps that is optimized for the two screens of the Surface Duo 2. Whenever I can, that is when I'm not driving, I use video for the best possible interpersonal communication. What I love about using Teams on the Duo 2 is that when somebody shares their screen, I can see it in detail without losing reference to the people on the call. I can even share a whiteboard and draw on it. Although for some strange reason, the whiteboard likes to occupy the top screen rather than the bottom screen. So my hand covers the call gallery while I draw on the top screen with the Slim Pen 2 on the whiteboard. Still, I can participate in a creative whiteboard discussion while I'm on a call with just my phone. The forward-facing camera on the Duo 2 does a good job of presenting me, and the dual microphone array that we've come to expect on Surface devices does an excellent job with audio. This pairing works brilliantly whether you're in laptop mode, portrait, tent, or single screen. Note-taking with pen and paper is one of the most important things to do in meetings. Taking notes by hand is better for memory and understanding, so I use the Surface Slim Pen to jot down quick key points in OneNote during a Teams call. OneNote at the bottom, Teams at the top. That's great when I'm out and about, but when I'm in the office, I prefer to take calls on my Surface Pro 8 or my Surface Studio. But the trouble with that is that I want to take notes on my device while I'm on a call. And with the Pro 8 and the Studio, the camera's mounted at the top of the screen. And it doesn't give the best view of me when it's flat on the desk. Now I've discussed some ways to get around this before, but now that I have a Surface Duo 2, I'll often use that as my note-taking device for Teams meetings. I'll have one note open in full screen, rotated into the portrait mode to give me the widest writing area. And the Slim Pen 2 that I have attached to the Duo also works on the Pro 8, so it's a powerful combination. So can I achieve more on calls than I could on a standard smartphone? Well, I'd say yes, absolutely. You can't effectively take notes when you're on a video call on any other smartphone on the market right now with the exception of the original Surface Duo. Every morning, I check in with a few things. I'm a bit of a slow riser, not a morning person, but don't accept your judgment by the way early risers. And I like to check in with social media and the news. I might check my calendar and maybe trio some email too. Now, I know I'm not alone in having a love-hate relationship with social media and the news. So using Android's digital wellbeing controls, I've put time limits on my social media and news apps. It works for me and it helps me be conscious of the time that I'm giving to these corporations. I've always been a voracious reader of nonfiction, and I usually had a pile of books by my bed to read at night and in the morning. But over the last 15 years of smartphones and social media, I found myself reading less and less. For me, that time has been sucked away by Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, you name it. Nothing wrong with any of those tools per se, they can be really useful. But it is well known through research that high social media use can lead to all sorts of mental health issues. And the companies behind those tools are mining our time and attention, and they're very good at it. It's incredibly hard not to get sucked into their rabbit holes. So I've resorted to arbitrary limits that are imposed by the digital wellbeing tools. Fortunately, the social media experience is generally not optimized for the Surface Duo 2. Apps like Instagram don't render properly on the 3x2 screen. I use it, but it's an odd experience that doesn't really make you want to invest more time in it. Facebook likewise does some weird things at times, and that's just fine with me. Let me use my phone for things that make me feel better, not worse, like note taking and reading, for example. So when my social media and news time is run out on the Duo 2, I'll check my email and then go to Kindle to read. The reading experience in Kindle is brilliant on the Duo. Although, oddly, someone pointed out that the page turn effect anchors to the far right or far left of the screen. Now I can't unsee it. But apart from that, the layout is near perfect. It's much easier to read with the context of two pages of text shown side by side, just like a book. And because it looks like a physical book, I think it's easier to think of it like a book. 
Reading on a candy bar phone, however, involves a lot of page turning, especially if you're over 40 and you need the font bigger so that you can actually read it. The Surface Duo 2 will not make you read more, of course. But in the last five months, I've read more than I have in years. And really, that's because I made a conscious choice to use this book-like form factor to change the way I use my phone. But could I say that the Surface Duo 2 has helped me to achieve more in the mornings? Absolutely. Outlook is optimized for the Duo 2. I don't personally compose a lot of emails on the Duo 2, but I do check in from time to time. I use Outlook to flag emails that I need to follow up on, to delete emails that I don't need, and to read emails that I can. So by the time I get into the office in the morning, I know that my inbox is pretty much ready for action. And if I did want to write an email on the Duo, it's pretty cool to be able to do it with digital ink with the pen. And because I rely on the Microsoft To Do task list app, simply flagging an email right here in Outlook has created a task for me. In fact, I have the swipe right gesture assigned to flag an email and swipe left to delete. I'm far more inclined to use the Duo 2 in the open format. I really value the extra screen real estate that it gives me, even with that strange gap down the middle. I just love the fact that I have effectively an iPad mini size screen that folds up and fits into my pocket. Volume wise, the Duo 2 would be similar to my old Galaxy Note 20, but the Galaxy Note was taller and skinnier, so it certainly fit into my pocket a little easier. But I've been carrying around larger and wider phones since around 2011 when I ditched my iPhone 3G for a Samsung Galaxy S2. Even Apple eventually realized that having more screen real estate was more important than how it fit in your pocket, even though it took them years to catch up as always. So when I'm using Outlook, I usually have it spanned across the two screens. That gives me my inbox list on the left, while the right screen gives me a reading pane. Occasionally, I'll need to check my calendar alongside of my email to try and coordinate an appointment. And Outlook actually allows you to run the calendar app as a separate instance on Android. So you can actually side by side the two apps. I have them set up as an app pair on the home screen that I can launch instantly. Unfortunately, drag and drop between the two apps is not yet enabled. It'd be really cool to see the ability to drag an email straight onto the calendar to assign a time to deal with it. That is something that I commonly do in Outlook on the desk or on the web. You could happily use Outlook on one screen of the Duo, but why when you have two? As I mentioned, I also use the Microsoft To Do app to manage and track my tasks. And To Do is actually linked directly to Outlook. It is simply a portal into Outlook's task list. Creating a task in To Do creates a task in Outlook. However, it's much better to have a separate app dedicated to just that purpose than trying to do tasks in Outlook. In addition to flagged emails, I create tasks directly in To Do. And when I come across an article on the web, in the news, or on LinkedIn that I want to capture for my research, I share it to To Do so that I can grab it with the OneNote web clipper when I'm back on my desktop. So the question is, can I do more with Outlook, email, calendar, and To Do with two screens? Does it help me to achieve more? Again, I'd say absolutely. Okay, getting very personal now. I have all of my best ideas in the shower and I shower in the morning. We're not doing B-roll, by the way, for this one, team. Some people get their ideas on a walk, a jog, a swim, a ride, in the car. For me, it's in the shower. When you achieve that relaxed state where your mind can run free, you can sort a lot of thoughts out. But if you don't capture those ideas or thoughts quickly, well, you lose them. And that's where the Duo 2 has been worth its weight in gold. No, the Duo 2 isn't waterproof, so it doesn't go in the shower, but it's small enough to be there with me when I need it and it's always ready to jot down a quick note or idea. In fact, I have the pen button set up to launch OneNote, and I have OneNote set to launch spanned across the two screens. So with a click, I'm taking notes on a digital piece of paper, and it's almost instantly synced with my Surface Pro 8, ready to do more with later. I capture the ideas for most of my video scripts this way. I can also capture an idea with even less effort in the Sticky Notes app that's integrated with the Microsoft Launcher app. It also syncs with my PC. Now, the downside of having a two-screen device that's very portable is that it is more prone to damage. And as I mentioned, the Duo 2 is not waterproof, only very mildly water resistant. I kitted mine out with a D-brand skin and the pen cover, which magnetically attaches the pen and charges it. And while this keeps the pen always handy, it does apparently impact battery life. I still get through most days without a charge, and the Duo 2 charges pretty quickly at 23 watts using an open standard USB-C port. But even with the protection of the pen cover, the hinge end is still exposed in a way that a normal phone in a case is not. I still think that having two screens is worth the risk, 
just to be able to take a digital note when I need it. So can I achieve more with the Surface Duo 2 and my big ideas? Just watch me. Now onto messaging. The Surface Duo 2 implements the open standard RCS platform and messaging works just fine with RCS. I can send pictures and videos in decent quality to my non-Apple using friends. Let's not get into the stupid debates about green and blue bubbles. America and Apple needs to get over this and give it up. The fact that masses of people are prepared to hand their wallets over to a massive corporation just so they can get a blue bubble, I think it's an indicator of the crumbling of Western society. Either way, I can happily send messages directly from the Your Phone app on my PC. In fact, Microsoft have now changed the name of that app to PhoneLink. And like most of the rest of the non-American world, we also use multi-platform messaging apps like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Viber, and more to share rich media. They all work just fine on the Duo 2, but with the added benefit that I can share information from app to app, from screen to screen without losing my place. So has the Surface Duo 2 helped me to achieve more with messaging? Yes, indeed. As Australia has started to emerge from its lockdown lifestyle this year, I've started to travel again. Still nowhere near as much as I used to, but it's great to be out interacting with people again. I use my plane time mainly for reading on the Duo 2, and when I'm too tired for that, I'll play some tunes through my noise cancelling Surface headphones too. When I arrive at my interstate destination, I'm usually juggling a lot of information, looking at my calendar, checking the address, opening Google Maps, figuring out where I need to go next, calling an Uber, briefing myself on what the meeting is about and who I'm going to be meeting with. As you can imagine, these scenarios benefit hugely from having two screens. Being able to correspond information from one app to another is a huge advantage. This stuff is incredibly taxing on a candy bar phone, where you're constantly swapping between apps while loading up your working memory. Business travelers would benefit so much from having a device like this. When I need to see more detail on Google Maps, I span it across the two screens. It gives me so much more context than a single screen phone ever could. The Surface Duo 2 takes a lot of the stress out of business travel. And as I move from meeting to meeting, I look at the meeting invites, and I open the attached documents to get a briefing on the fly side by side. If I've met with these people before, I'll probably have a page in OneNote with my notes from the last meeting. So I can open up OneNote alongside of the calendar and I can remind myself of who I met with last time and what we spoke about. And as I collect a physical receipt or a tax invoice or some documentation for my expenses throughout the day, I take a digital photograph of it with the Office Lens app and I throw away the paper copy. Now, if Microsoft really wanna make this phone unique, Having direct Office 365 integration with the stock camera app would make life so much easier because with a double tap on the power button, I can be ready to grab a document and go. For now, I need to find and launch the Office Lens app. Unfortunately, it's not at all optimized for two screens, which is a shame since it could really make use of that extra screen real estate. While we're talking cameras, we all love to take a quick snap in a new place. And the camera array on the back of the Surface Duo 2 does a decent job of photos. It's probably not the best camera on the market, but neither is any smartphone camera. They're all quite poor, really. I'm sorry to burst anybody's bubble there, but it's the software and it's the smarts in the respective camera apps that compensate for the tiny sensors and lenses. But of course, what a phone camera lacks in quality, it makes up for inconvenience. And when taking photos with the Surface Duo 2's camera array, I can see the shot that I've just taken in a full screen preview on the other screen. I can also fold the screen into different ways that make it easier to hold. That said, its design kind of excludes the use of a selfie stick and it won't fit into the holder of my DJI Mavic 2 remote control either. But the Surface Duo 2's camera does a decent job in daylight. However, the software is still lacking in low light. There have been many updates to the camera software over the last six months, so hopefully it will continue to get better before it's ready for the masses. And then there's watching videos. I've been a frequent flyer for many years and I've sat next to many people who've held their arm out, propping up a phone for an entire flight to watch videos. And I really don't know how they do it. With the Duo 2, you can prop it up in tent mode on the tray table. So it stands alone while you watch a video hands-free, which is genius. But I must say that I actually watch a lot of videos spanned across the two screens on the Duo 2. Yes, I am one of those. Now, most people hate this. And I personally feel that the gap almost disappears, kind of like your nose when you do this enough. So I'm committed to it for the simple reason that I'm over 40 years old. And once you go over 40, your eyesight tends to go downhill. Happens to everyone with age. So for me, being able to see more detail, well, that overrides the minor irritation of that gap down the middle. Young people, well, you can just continue to watch your videos on one screen and that'll be fine. 
Amazon, eBay, and AliExpress are my triad of online shopping apps. And it's great to be able to look at a vendor's website while I compare pricing, reviews, and other information with a shopping app. But there are limitations to the two screen mechanics right now. Out of the box, the Duo 2 uses Android stock gestures for navigation and app control. Initially, I found these to be very finicky with the two screen setup. There seemed to be issues in Android understanding which screen it was working with at any time. And the result was that I felt like missed touches or a lack of response. Since the Duo 2 is one of the only two screen mobile devices out there, it's logical to think that it would be a big part of the development process and testing of 12L. So I do expect to see it to pop up pretty quickly once it's available, despite Microsoft's history of slow major Android release updates. In the meantime, encountering these sorts of issues is very annoying. And Microsoft have been pretty good at delivering monthly security, performance and feature updates within the current Android version 11. And that has delivered a lot of improvements. But having to change to button nav and back again is pretty frustrating. Occasionally I've had to close and open the phone to get it to work properly. Very occasionally I've even had to reboot it. Now that's something that I haven't had to do on one of my Samsung phones for many, many years. But over the last five months, the frequency of reboots has probably gone from once a week to once a month. It's still far from ideal, but it's the price you pay, at least for now, for a device that can help you to achieve more, if you're prepared to invest the time, suffering and money. So let's talk about the money. For us here in Australia, the Surface Duo 2 sells at a starting price of 2,319. An iPhone 13 Pro Max sells for $1,849. A Galaxy S22 sells for $1,549. How can they justify this price? How can I justify it for myself? Well, it's easy, really. It's all in the value equation. The value of any purchase that I make is equal to the benefits divided by the price. So the only question I need to ask to decide whether this device is worth it for me is what benefit would I derive from it? So I'll recap what's in it for me. I can participate in Teams meetings far more effectively on the Duo 2 than any other mobile device that fits into my pocket. I can participate in whiteboards, take notes, and see what's being presented on the screen. I can take notes with the Duo 2 while I participate in a video call on my Surface Pro 8. I can wean myself off social media and spend much more time reading. I can stay on top of my email, see more and do more with my to-do list. I can capture my next big idea when it happens, and I can do something about it. I can be far more organized and have the information that I need at my fingertips when I'm traveling and attending in-person meetings. I can compare different websites and shopping apps to make sure that I'm getting the best deal all from my phone. And that's just the start. So how do you put a price on all of that? I mean, the benefits to me are potentially in the millions of dollars. And when I divide that by the price of 2,319 Australian to get my value ratio, well, I think it's a no brainer. And even though there are plenty of bugs and niggles along the way, I can do all of this with far less stress than I would experience on a single screen device because trying to get things done on a tiny screen is just painful and stressful. We already put up with insane compromises on mobile devices, and we accept the pain so that we can have the benefit of a computer in our pocket. So why not put up with some bugs so that we can have a computer in our pocket that has double the screen, and therefore puts you through less pain and suffering? Of course, if you just want to spend 10 hours a day on TikTok, then the benefit of this device is non-existent, and the value would be in the negative. So it's not surprising to me that Microsoft decided not to launch this product in the retail market in Australia. It's really not a compelling device for the average social media consumer. But for the business user, people like me, the Surface Duo 2 offers incredible potential. So if you're an achieve more kind of a person, then why not hit subscribe? We release a couple of videos like this every week covering everything in the Microsoft world from Surface and multimodal computing to running better meetings in Teams. Consider hitting that notification bell too so that you know when we release a new video and we'll see you next week.